Every so often, and by that I mean not that often at all, a game comes along which totally surprises you, enthralls you, and changes your perception on gaming. Sure, it's easy to pick the big hitters like Super Mario 64, or any of the Zelda games on N64, but when I think of games on the system that were truly changing experiences for me, then I never need to look further than Mystical Ninja Star and Goemon. Whilst it's now a game which is routinely praised as being one of the most unique adventure games on N64, it wasn't always supposed to be this way, and the game had one of the most interesting development and release cycles on N64. And so get comfortable because this one's likely to be a longer review than normal, and there's going to be a lot of doses of my nostalgic memories thrown in. I'd also love for you to let me know what your favourite memory of this game was in the comments section down below, because I'm sure many of us have similar experiences, but you may also help to jog someone else's memory who's forgotten about the game and relive their childhood memories of it. The game started its development cycle under the name of Going On 5, which was planned to continue the series of the previous four titles, and was being developed in-house by Konami Osaka. Being their first project for Nintendo 64, the team felt that the working title and the final game's name should move away from the numerical sequence to create a clean break with what was the previous generation on Super Nintendo and the move into the 3D games which will be from the N64 onwards. The decision was eventually made to rework the title as The Legend of the Mystical Ninja and subsequently Mystical Ninja starring Goemon. The name of the game, however, wasn't the studio's biggest problem. During pretty much the entirety of the game's development, it was always planned to feature a two-player co-op mode, and even at E3 in June of 1997, just mere months before the game's Japanese release, not only that, but huge amounts of content and set pieces in the game were also complete, but they weren't quite fitting into the final storyline of the game. These included additional impact battles in locations such as a modern day city, a jungle like environment and even a village style setting. As we all know these were all scrapped but it was perhaps the feedback from E3 that year which really changes the course of the game. Although many previews of the time said that the game was really interesting, they pretty much universally condemned the game's camera system which was hugely flawed and the amount of clipping and pop-up in the game was routinely being used as a concern across the gaming media. I can only assume that because the game was supposedly about 70% complete at that time, they decided to drop the additional impact battles in the game and instead focus on solving the camera and the pop-up issues, which really would have been a ticking time bomb for the game's release. Miraculously, by the time the game was released in Japan, many of these issues from E3 were worked out of the game, and it would go on to sell over 140,000 copies in the console's lifespan in Japan. In the West, however, the story was a whole different ball game. Simply put, the entire game series was popular to an extent in Japan, but very few of the series had ever had a Western release. This was concerning for Konami, who didn't want to pick up the cost of translating the game and then releasing it to a Western audience only for the game to flop. For this reason, it was decided that the game would remain a Japanese exclusive title, and news was sent out to gaming publications and media across the world that the game wouldn't be getting a westernised translation. Now, I vividly remember reading issue number 7 of N64 magazine here in the UK, and for anyone who's interested, you can actually read the full import review they did of the game by going to the N64 Magazine time capsule episode, and I'll put a link to that in the description. But in short, they found the game to be enjoyable, but completely bizarre. And although they were having fun with the game, they were constantly getting stuck due to a lack of Japanese understanding. They felt that they had completed about half of the game, and they awarded it about an 80% rating, but even in the closing statements they said of their review, they confirmed that the likelihood it would ever get a Western release was looking very unlikely now, and so the game would be for import enthusiasts looking for something completely Japanese. Now a mere four weeks later, and in the very next issue, the magazine team were flabbergasted to say the decision had been reversed and that a translation and an expected release date for the Western release would be early 1998. I was so stoked to hear that because as I had poured over those screenshots and explanations about who the characters were, it had absolutely grabbed my attention. 
It was like something strange, you know, an over-the-top fantasy game crossing the weird and wonderful world of a medieval Japan with what sounded like absolutely crazy storyline pieces and an overall adventure that took you across the whole of Japan. Whilst N64 Magazine would always review and even go as far as to preview import games from Japan, nothing had seemed quite as in-your-face Japanese as what the screenshots were showing. You've got to remember that back in 1997 the internet wasn't anywhere near in terms of gaming news that it is today. Sure you'd get the odd snippet on a message board from someone who'd been to one of the many trade shows, but as a whole you'd see the screenshots and information in magazines and that would be your deal breaker when it came to deciding to buy the eventual game or not. As my anticipation had grown steadily for the game's release it's really no surprise that I made sure this was a day one pickup for me. Now the small town I lived meant that some of the less in demand games would be hard to come by. And so I remember intentionally calling my local game store for a good couple of weeks before the game's expected release date and asking the guy who owned the store if they had a copy of it in stock. Then I would get my brother to ring up maybe a day or two later to ask the same question, sometimes even a few hours later. Now I don't know why I thought it would really be a good idea to do this and I really don't know why I thought that the store owner wouldn't pick up on the fact it was me and my brother ringing up you know, every few days asking if the game was in stock, but my thought process at the time was if I kept ringing and asking for this specific game, he would think that there's a lot of demand for it so he'd make sure he had multiple copies. Thankfully though it didn't come to that as we had no problem picking up on day one. And the reason I can remember that so vividly is because I was so sick that day. Now for some reason in the April school holidays, which here in the UK are always two weeks, I would always for some reason be sick for the first week of that two week break every single year. I remember being at home with a fever and my parents were out working, my sister was away for the day and my brother had gone out to play with some of his friends and so I was home alone feeling pretty dizzy and spaced out. Now I remember my mum calling me in the morning to check how I was doing and she asked what would make me feel better and so naturally I said well if I had Mystical Ninja starring Goemon to play it would help distract me from the queasiness. And so she told my brother to take some cash from the house or office that we had and go pick me up the game. My brother came home, dropped the game off and went back out with his friends and so I was home alone with the game. I remember putting it in and after a few months of waiting I was finally flicking the power on to start my adventure in the game. And then that song started. I remember being furious thinking that somehow the store owner had given us a Japanese copy of the game and that somehow it actually had worked on our PAL console. But then I started playing and the sight of a semi-naked fat bloke running in the street accompanied by English text explaining that he had taken his clothes off and was doing an hypnotic dance to try and get them a discount which had resulted in them being chased out of the establishment. It was at that moment I looked at the bottle of cowpaw which I had been chugging to control my fever and I wondered if it was in fact a secret stash of LSD because this was some straight up weirdness that I hadn't seen before and so I couldn't possibly understand the game being that weird. But how on how wrong I was. So look, now's a good time to jump into the actual review and oddly I'm going to be starting off with the game's music because oh my god this has to be one of the console's best overall combined soundtracks. When I heard that initial intro song with full voice work and wacky lyrics, I knew the game would be something special, but Konami smashed the soundtrack here completely out of the park. A good point to note here is that the game was designed with a 128 mg cart to allow for an expanded range of music, which Konami felt was essential to really get the overall tone that they were going for. The game features three full length songs including singing and it was composed entirely by a team of just four people. It became that popular that the soundtrack was released on CD shortly after the game's release and that's why there's some really crisp copies of the game's soundtrack which people have kindly uploaded to YouTube for everybody to enjoy. The soundtrack blends a mix of Japanese instruments with some western vibes which was completely unique considering that the game wasn't originally even going to be seeing a western release. But let's be honest, as soon as you thought of this game there was only one piece of music which comes to mind. Sorry. 
the minute I heard this song, I had another moment where I was checking the pills that I'd been taking. I wasn't familiar with Impact as a character, and so I hadn't followed the series before this game. And so when, when I was playing, all of a sudden, there was a karaoke style jingle being sung by some guy that could have been on the TV show Banzai, I had no clue what was going down. And let's be honest too, when I tried telling my brother that night that, well, I'd seen something completely bizarre, I didn't really think that he'd believe me, and of course there was no way to just go back and replay that specific section, even just to hear the music again. It became so infamous amongst the people that I knew that there was only a small clique of us at school who had heard it, and we would talk about how random this song was. As fantastic as the game's music is though, and trust me, you can have it on repeat and it still feels fresh some 20 years later, it was a game storyline which was absolutely off the charts insane. One thing to note however is that the entire game is completely self-aware. You have a laughter track to punctuate jokes, and the entire game is set out like a play being watched and you as a player are the audience. So the game begins with Gorimon and Abisumaru, and as I mentioned previously, and after the initial comedy segment, they're interrupted by a peach-shaped UFO shaking the ground. The peach-shaped UFO fires a laser at Edo Castle and turns it into the worst possible thing imaginable. A European-style castle. I never expected to see such filth in a Nintendo 64 game. And this European castle concerns the chaps enough to start worrying about the Lord and his daughter, and so they go to investigate. After defeating the first castle, the team find Baron, who is a member of a fashion-loving gang named The Four, and that he was sent to the castle to turn it into one big fabulous stage. With the Lord now free, he gives the lads permission to travel the Japanese roads and continue their quest. And to avoid any, well, spoilers here, for those of you that haven't played the game yet, I don't really want to go into too much more detail, but let's just say things get even weirder and weirder. You have the more unusual items to access, and by the time the game is complete, you'll often have certain scenes and moments from the game etched into your memory forever. And it's important to note that as you play the game, your team does expand with the addition of the characters Ye and Sasuke, which gives you a team of four playable characters by the end of the game. What felt really special about this was that during the game you'll need all four characters, as they each have their own special abilities and they genuinely feel very very different to play as. There is a small amount of backtracking as you unlock new characters to play as, and earn their special moves and complete minigames which allow you to use their unique skills, but it feels well integrated into the game rather than a way to flesh out the length of the game by taking on random side quests. One thing which reviewers of the time did criticise quite heavily was the lack of multiplayer co-op modes, which the previous entries in the series were really well known for. Now I agree it would have been cool to have basically had a multiplayer experience, but I do feel that as a single player experience the game is extremely well placed and delivers. I also love how as you go through the game's later dungeons, which do become progressively more complex, that you'll need to be changing different characters on the fly, which really requires you mastering each character's skills and abilities. And with four, well, feeling very, very different, this isn't the easiest thing to do. And yet, it's a way which the developer added to the game's overall challenge without taking cheap routes, for example, by adding OP enemies or overloading the odds against you in certain scenes or boss battles. Whilst the game is an adventure RPG, I must stress that this is really one element that you really want to explore because, you know, some RPG games, they can be dull in certain moments when you go into a new town and you're hearing the townspeople repeat the same lines to you, and sometimes it's completely uninteresting speech. But when you play the game here, you really want to speak to as many people as possible because they come out with some of the most strange things in conversations at times. Now this, in part, as is well known, was down to the translation which many reviewers said was so poor that it actually became good. It's hard to see exactly what they were going for in the translation though, because whilst I will agree it uses lots of words, phrases and speech patterns that just aren't common in English, the end result in my opinion just further adds to the weird tone of the game, whether that was an intentional decision or not. What I always found interesting though was the fact that many of the game's jokes just really don't translate to a Western audience. 
Sure, the innuendos are damn funny, but there are other times in the game where you'll hear the laughter track kick in and you'll be sat there wondering what was funny about what you've just read. And I mentioned four playable characters as previously mentioned, but that's not entirely true because whilst you have four characters in the main game, forgetting to mention impact would be a sin. These sections take you away from the open world 3D feudal areas and instead slam you into the cockpit of impact after the awesome tune is complete. These sections first see you do a mini game warm up which you try and destruct as much as possible in your path and the more you destroy the more energy you have when it takes you on to the actual boss. And those segments put you in a first person view and there you have to duke it out in an almost Power Rangers style battle with a giant boss. These moments are highlights in the game and seem to land at just the right point to break up the main gameplay for a few moments. Aside from that you also have plenty of mini games to play through and my personal favourite was playing hide and seek with Abisumaru in the cupboard which to me always felt quite intense. And whilst overall I love the aesthetic of the game you can tell this is clearly one of the early Nintendo 64 titles. You have fog in some of the more wide open spaces, the camera can still be an issue at times and the texture quality is mediocre at best. I would argue however that with how awesome the art direction is in the game you'll hardly notice this because you'll see in here there's so much to look at and there's lots of unique things here that you just don't see in other N64 titles. Each area you enter in the game whilst often sparse in terms of features it really feels like they do have their own unique atmosphere. The castles usually feel super over the top in terms of colours and even the villages themselves feel like they have their own personality. The character designs are superb and the wide eyed designs allowed for some easy implementation of emotions into them. You'll also notice subtle details such as Abyssumaru's mincing walk and Sasuke's retractable hair that just bring a little bit more life into the characters than just relying on the storytelling. Of course this would all be terrible to play if the controls were abysmal and look again this is an earlier N64 title and so expecting Zelda levels of balance would be wrong but for the time when the game was released I really don't remember ever thinking I died a cheap death due to poor controls and even to this day I think that the game's perfectly playable and responsive. Some of the more 3D moments like for example using Ye's mermaid ability do show the lack of polish in the controls from a 3D perspective, but overall these moments are very few and far between. The fact that the game also mixes exploration moments, mini games, impact sections and impact boss battles means that you have a few different control styles to get used to, but they do all feel responsive and fairly intuitive if you've played pretty much a handful of other N64 games. Overall it's pretty hard to explain exactly what the overall package of Mystical Ninja starring Goemon it really is. It's got a great story, unique graphics, some of the best music on the console and characters which are still extremely enjoyable to play and interact with. Perhaps it's the letdown for many of us that the sequel went back to the series roots by being a side scroller and many of us were really yearning for a true 3D follow up to this epic quest. It's also worth noting that the game landed in a period of time when the release of games was quite slow on Nintendo 64 and so perhaps led people who got the game to really stick with it and to play it all the way through to completion. It sadly only sold about 50,000 copies in the US and much less in Europe and yet whenever you start speaking to anyone about their favourite Nintendo 64 games it's only a matter of time before this classic title gets thrown into the mix. For me it's easily top 10 material and as I mentioned earlier it's a game which I still enjoy playing to completion every few years just to remind myself of just how much fun it is. To me the relatively low sales numbers combined with the cult status the game has only further supports my views that this is a game which many people picked up on a personal recommendation from somebody else. And so if you like what you've heard and you're curious about what you've seen on the screen then I urge you to give this timeless classic a blast if you haven't played it before. And so for today's topic of conversation I'd love to know who your favourite character in the game was. And you don't have to choose one of the four main characters either because let's be honest it's only a matter of time before we all start talking about plasma. Sound off in the comment section down below and until next time.